Hello everyone, I'm Linda Kincaid. You're watching CNN Newsroom live from Atlanta tonight. Apologies to a Ukrainian widow. The first Russian soldier on trial for war crimes says he's sorry. We'll have reaction from the courtroom. Then US President Joe Biden gives his full backing to Sweden and Finland's bid to join NATO. We'll go live to the White House. And later, more restrictions for women in Afghanistan as the Taliban tells female journalists to cover their faces on air. We'll have a special report from Kabul. Hundreds more Ukrainian fighters in Mariupol have walked out of underground bunkers into an unknown fate. But others still haven't ended their last stand at the steel plant that's become a nationwide symbol of resistance. Russia says more than 1,700 Mariupol fighters have now surrendered, most taken to a pre-trial detention center in Russian-controlled territory. Ukraine says evacuation efforts are still underway but won't release details. The International Red Cross says it's registering combatants who leave the plant as prisoners of war. Russia hasn't said whether it plans to exchange them in a prisoner swap or put them on trial. One Ukrainian commander still inside the plant has posted on social media vowing to quote that the fight continues. Elsewhere in the Donetsk region, Russia is bombarding a town that is an important hub for the Ukrainian military. But a regional official says civilian targets are being hit. Russia is also relentlessly shelling the easternmost city still held by Ukraine. Officials there say 12 civilians were killed today in Severodonetsk, but they say defenses are holding. And in Ukraine's capital, an extraordinary and powerful moment at the first trial of a Russian soldier accused of war crimes. The 21-year-old who has pleaded guilty to killing an elderly man described how and why he shot him. And then he looked the man's widow in the eyes and apologized. Can you please tell me, what did you feel when you killed my husband? Shame. Do you repent? Yes, I acknowledge my fault. I understand that you will not be able to forgive me, but I am sorry. One more question. Why did you come here? Did you come to defend us? From whom? Did you defend me from my husband you killed? Our command gave us an order to move in as a column. I didn't know what would follow. Well, Melissa Bell is following the trial for us in Kiev and joins us now live. Good to have you with us, Melissa. That uh, was certainly a very powerful exchange between the widow and the Russian. Uh, the soldier, of course, facing life behind bars, saying he's sorry. Saying he's sorry, and also in the end of that exchange, Linda, the widow of the uh, uh, civilian who was killed by Shishimaran, and bear in mind that Vadim Shishimaran at this stage has pled guilty uh, to that. He recognizes it. Uh, uh, he, the widow then goes on to say, you know, what were you doing defending us, referring really to uh, that justification for the war that was given on the Russian side to its soldiers, uh, that this was a special operation, uh, not uh, an invasion of a country. And... Uh, not a war, remember, that's been a crucial distinction that's been made on the Russian side. And uh, putting that to him, and I think that very poignant reply that comes when he says, we were told to move in, our column was told to move in, we did not know what would follow. And I think that's remarkable to hear that firsthand from a Russian soldier, 21-year-old Russian soldier. Now, that was, of course, one of the most poignant moments uh, of the trial. Another came when another uh, of the soldiers, one who was traveling with Vadim Shishimarin on that day. Once their convoy of tanks hit, his hit a landmine, they escaped in a stolen car. In that car, uh, when the unarmed civilian was killed because Vadim Shishimarin says he was given an order to kill him by one of the uh, people traveling in the car with him, one of the other soldiers. Uh, and what this other soldier, Ivan Maltisov, says is confirming really that version of events, saying they were under tremendous pressure and an order was given for Vadim Shishimarin uh, to shoot. Have a listen to what this other soldier traveling with him that day had to say. The ensign ordered Vadim to shoot, reasoning the man could be reporting on us. Vadim refused to do it. 
Then the unidentified military man turned around and shouted in orderly tone, demanding Vadim execute the order. Otherwise, he'll be intercepted and never make it to our base to request help. And under pressure from this, servicemen fired. It's striking as well when you look at both soldiers, just how young they are, uh, Linda. I think that's one of the things that struck us so much over the course of the last few days. On the question of the sentencing, uh, this trial continues tomorrow. The prosecution is calling for Vadim Shishimarin to, to have face life in jail. Uh, the widow uh, that you just heard from in that exchange opposite Vadim Shishimarin also believes he should spend the rest of his life in jail. Uh, but she said there is one alternative, and that would be if he could be exchanged uh, for the many hundreds of evacuated as of stall fighters currently in Russian hands, Linda. Yeah, uh, that would be a, a significant request. And I do want to ask you about that, Melissa, because uh, the Russian Defense Ministry says uh, more than 1,700 soldiers have now surrendered at that steel plant since Monday, uh, which means another 770 plus have surrendered in the last 24 hours. Uh, certainly a significant increase. Uh, what do we make of those comments coming from Russia and what are the Ukrainians saying? I think the figure of more than 1,700 is remarkable in and of itself. Remember that when we were covering this uh, last bastion of resistance until they surrendered uh, a, a couple of days ago, uh, we were talking about hundreds of fighters mm. still holed up in Azovstal. We didn't have any real figures. Uh, so 1,700 already in the hands of uh, Russian forces is remarkable. It's a big number, but perhaps even more remarkable. And we knew that uh, from the Russian side itself, from the head of the Donetsk People's Republic, which is physically uh, the part of uh, the part of those Russian uh, held territories now where those soldiers are being kept and for the most wounded treated. Uh, what we'd heard from that leader was that the most senior commanders of the Avastol forces were not amongst those evacuated. So that was interesting as well. It suggests there are many more inside. We don't have a precise number. We don't know for this time, Linda, whether or if any have been killed. What we have just found out from an extraordinary post that's just emerged that was published actually yesterday is that one of the Azovstal fighters posted that he was holding out and intending to resist. And I think that is a remarkable development in this story as well, Linda. Yeah, it certainly is. And we are going to speak more about that with our uh, guest coming up next. Melissa Bell in Kiev, thanks so much.